So welcome everybody. We are delighted um, to have um, Dr. Sasha Atkins, who's a senior lecturer in environmental health sciences, um, give the first Dean seminar for the year. Um, Sasha joined us last year as a, um, a lecturer in the department. And um, she has a very interesting background of understanding environmental factors related to plastics, human health, and sort of planetary health as well. Um, she's got, you know, teaching credentials from a couple of different universities um, and has also had interest in understanding things from a global health justice viewpoint. Um, and so she's very much um, adept at sort of contributing to the school and the school's mission, as well as what the department's very interested in. And we love to talk a little bit about what's unique um, in reference to some of our faculty members. And Sasha, I was amazed at the unique tidbit that you actually gave us that Sasha grew up on a 37 foot sailboat. I know <laughs> my partner would be so jealous of hearing <laughs> about that as we venture into our retirement of um, partially living on a sailboat. So um, I look forward to having a lot of discussions with you, but I actually do think that that brings sort of gives us an insight onto why you care so much about planetary health. Once you've lived on the water, been on the water, and have sailed the coast, you begin to understand how important it is that the way we treat and live in our environment will really affect, you know, our climate. So with that, Sasha, we are so interested in hearing from you and the topic that you have to present today. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation, this opportunity to present. I am honored today to be joined by my colleague and actually my mentor, Delia Barajas, who has been working with me throughout my time in Chicago at Loyola on uh, environmental justice work in Cicero. And so we are going to be talking today about a project that we have been working on together. And I'll begin sharing my slides. Delia asked that I introduce her simply as a concerned member of the community who cares about justice and who cares about giving a voice to people who are vulnerable and whose voices are not listened to. But she's actually so much more. And so I will also share that she uh, was the founder of Ixchel Environmental Justice Group and a co-founder of a intergenerational queer-led uh, Cicero Community Farm Environmental Justice Group, and so much more. So today we are going to informally share with you some of the stories and lessons we've been learning in our adventure in community-owned research. But I'd like to dedicate this presentation to Mary Zach, who is my community partner in Otsego, Michigan. Unfortunately, Mary's cancer came back and she is in the final stages of lung cancer. She developed um, a ter teratoma in high school and she recovered from that. And from that experience was motivated to do a symptom survey of nearly 1000 neighbors in Otsego, Michigan, and to begin tracking trends in the disease cases that were observed versus what was expected. When she got sick this time, we had been working on what we called the Tooth Fairy Project. She had collected baby teeth from around the town and we were going to have them analyzed actually for PFAS, which is um, a novel methodology for assessing prenatal and early life exposures to PFAS along we were going to look also along with a lead and other heavy metals and, and then compare the record in the baby teeth uh, exposures to adult health outcomes. So such a loss um, and, and we'll always remember Mary. So I'd like to begin the talk with making explicit my personal and intellectual commitments in this work. Um, one is, of course, to long res 
long-term reciprocal relationships. Delia's photo is here. And also Yanning Wei, who supervised the GIS part of our work. Um, Alfred Diggs, who is uh, an amazing teacher in biology and lives quite near to Cicero and has been collaborating on our lettuce and isopods branch of the project, which you'll hear about later. I had entire classes of students go work in the community, but the student collaborators listed here either did a capstone with me or were students from other universities who came and intensively joined the project, dedicating many hours. And so we thank them for their work and the other collaborators will be named throughout the slide deck. There is a familiar spectrum of community engagement to ownership, and it ends with deferring to the community, community-owned work. This didn't speak to me because it seems as though the subject of the sentence is still the academic partner. I ignore, I inform, I consult, etc., And then the community is the object of that sentence. And so what we came up with was um, an even more strong statement of our philosophy. The Environmental Justice Cooperative seeks to move beyond this spectrum towards community-owned and community-driven research where academic partners provide technical logistical support to facilitate achieving the goals that communities themselves have set. The role of the academic partner is defined by and delimited by the changing needs of the community residents and the relationship building moves at the speed of trust, which makes it difficult to have grants because then you have to move at the speed that the funders need their deliverables. So we've been doing all of this work that we'll be talking about today with uh, donations. We strongly believe in asset-based community development. DePaul in Chicago has a, a whole program devoted to this where we don't ask what's wrong with the community, but we ask what's right. And we look for the work that is already being done by the residents of the community and we uplift and support that. I personally subscribe to standpoint theory which is like the old Sufi proverb of the elephant, where everybody's blind and touching a different part of the elephant. And someone describes the tusk and says an elephant is sharp and pointy and someone else is touching the tail. And they say, no, no, an elephant is coily and wiggly and, and we're all accessing different parts of the truth. And when we put everyone's perspective together, then we have a more complete idea and a more objective version. So Sandra Harding, who's a critical feminist epistemologist, calls this strong objectivity. And a corollary to that is that our positionality matters. And so my positionality, my social location, as someone who is not a resident of Cicero, has never been a resident of Cicero, whose society reads as white, and who has a lot of privilege for my academic credentials and um, career, having worked in the community as an outsider for a very long time, started in the 90s working at Maturanda La Luz in El Paso Juarez, um, attending births and training as a midwife there um, through Southeast Georgia's Communities Project, working with migrant farm workers, um, doing HIV testing and outreach and education and acting as a lay chaplain for immigrant children who were in detention and separated from their families, and also um, volunteering with Catholic Worker with Immigrant Justice. Um, it's a, an outsider perspective. All right, so now we get into the fun part, learning about Cicero. So Delia, if you would please, um, perhaps you could tell us what makes Cicero so special. What are some of the best things about being a member of the community of Cicero? Um, for me, and actually what are so important to Cicero and what I believe 
truly are is the community. Um, Cicero is a really small community, but mostly um, Mexican immigrants with a large percentage of undocumented folks, mostly from Mexico. Um, we also have quite a few DACA students who are basically just standing on the waiting lines to see what will the president do. And um, also now that there are some asylum seekers, mostly from Venezuela coming in. So it's the people, um, the people, what I see every single day, um, it reminds me of my both grandparents, ma ma maternal and paternal grandparents. I basically see it very similar to what is happening here. Um, as my grandparents migrated to the United States and um, looking always for a better life. Um, unfortunately, I learned that that American dream is not true, at least not for us immigrants who come into this country. Um, so basically it's the people. I have to say it's the people that keeps me here, um, the politics and um, actually the government, local government and state government um, has been very difficult to work with. And so it's the people that keeps me here. Thank you. So Delia was telling me that they have a president of Cicero, right? Larry is the president. <laughs> when you speak of difficult political situations and has been the president for how long now? Actually, I lost count. <laughs> how many years he's been in office? Right, I, I, I've lost count and basically he was a retired police officer, um, but he has already been in some kind of legal issues as well in regards to like um, harassment, sexual harassment and things like that. But that is not new to Cicero. Um, he's not the only person, what we call president. Our last president before, previous to Larry Dominic was basically indicted and um, did serve some uh, jail time in Cicero. I mean, not in Cicero, but she was this, Lauren Maltese was her name. And so her husband was also involved with a lot of corruption as she was. And um, before they were able to um, go to court and, and to actually get a sentence for prison, he died from cancer and she took over. You know, I looked Cicero up and um, it was like a Wikipedia article when I first started learning about the community. And it said um, there's a history of, of mafia and corruption in the city. And it, I was a little taken aback to see that um, written publicly like that. But there are challenges here as well. And so 90% of our residents, the community that Delia was mentioning that makes it such a special place, are Hispanic, 38.8% um, foreign born. And 9% have attained a bachelor's degree or higher. Median income, 49,367 a year for the household. And 62.2% living below the poverty line. Major employers are manufacturing and industry. And EJ Screen from the EPA um, classifies Cicero as an environmental justice community. And in the latest climate and economic justice screening tool, most of Cicero you'll see here is shaded in as quote unquote disadvantaged. One of the other assets is that there's a really strong faith community. Um, Roman Catholic Church draws quite a number of congregants. And I was at a Jesuit university. And so La Auto Si was something that I was um, trained in and working on as well. And so I was excited to see that Delia is working with St. Mary Francis of the Five Wounds Church. And I know that there have been some difficulties there. We won't have time to go into now, but Delia is doing planetary health, consciousness raising, um, and we'll be showing a movie, The Letter, about this encyclical. As I mentioned, Cicero Community Farm, we did a community movie night. Was that last summer? Um, we showed virtually a movie called Fire and Flood, 
queer resilience in the era of climate change, which talks about um, communities in Puerto Rico and California where trans and queer led organizers are creating safety and creating more resilient food networks. And this was designed to inspire folks in Cicero to think about how to increase resilience to climate change there. So one of the first problems that was addressed was lead in the drinking water. And I am not by any means the first academic partner that Delia has worked with. So she'll tell us a little bit about Virginia Tech and how they helped sample the, the water for lead in Cicero. Yeah, sure. So um, I have been in Cicero since 1991. Um, in 1991, basically, there was a lot of gentrification going on um, on the east side, closer to downtown. And so folks were moving um, at a more affordable place, which I'm located is on the west side. Um, basically, west, when um, are your low income folks, you cannot go east or you cannot go north because those are more expensive communities. So basically it was a displacement um, awakening for me and what happens in our communities when we get displaced. So Cicero, um, when I started, first of all, I have to say as a mom, as a community member, um, well, as a community member now in Cicero, I felt like um, I didn't do my homework as a mom in regards to what the, the Cicero um, educational system was like. Um, and, and this is kind of a uh, side piece as well. I also was working on education in regards to the school system that especially the English language learners not actually um, passing any state standards in Cicero. So we filed the civil rights actually um, case against them. It's still pending. Um, but basically it was because of they were the children that were coming in. Sister was not prepared for the big influx of Latino families. So, and basically that's still the case. Um, unfortunately, our, our students in our elementary ed and our high school um, are not ready to actually, I mean, we have some great intelligent students and families. It's just the school system is really focuses on school to prison pipeline, unfortunately. Um, going back to the water, um, I always knew that Cicero um, was a hot spot in lead. And everything I'm kind of discussing is basically just me doing some investigation and research. And I found that there, were, there was an um, issue with lead paint in our homes. And basically, there was no real information saying how damaging that can be. So I raised six kids and 14 grandkids in my home that um, the only thing when I purchased my house was a little kind of a, a, a sheet of paper just saying, oh, be advised, kind of this, there's lead paint in your home. Um, and I'm blanking on the year that they basically said you have to, you know, that using that lead paint was... Um, not allowed anymore. So, so basically, yeah, I raised my six kids in this bungalow old home, which is a hundred years old. And um, my 14 grandkids were here a lot. And that's what a lot of our families have gone through. And still there is, um, there are lead emitters in Cicero. I looked that up and asked, since we are an EJ community, I contacted EPA. There was like 10 lead emitters just in Cicero. And so I really didn't understand how to read the consumer um, drinking water issues. So I just, something caught my eye when it says that they failed to check something. So we need to be careful with our drinking water. Um, so I contacted Virginia Tech, this was in 2017, and basically just asked, how much would you charge us? Um, you know, because we were grassroots community organization, so we really didn't have a lot of funding. How much would you charge us to do some testing, initial chest testing in Cicero? And basically he gave us a price and we just said, well, we can't do that. So um, basically he came back with a proposal saying, hey, we'll give you 10 um, test kits and then let's see what we find. And so that was 2017. 
moving forward, there were some questionable um, concerns he had as um, the as a scientist at Virginia Tech, Mark Edwards, who did the whole Flint, Michigan um, issue. And so we did another round of testing and it still showed some concerning um, percentages of what was happening here in Cicero. So finally, they, Virginia Tech came out and, on, our, on our request because um, there was some real questionable percentage of what, you know, the 15 parts per billion is what um, EPA says is the standard. Um, there's, so we did, we did in Cicero the largest um, lead testing in the suburbs. I'm not saying Chicago, but Cicero being a grassroots community did the largest um, actual testing in regards and um, to test our water. And yeah, they found the lead. Um, they, we tried to, con we did contact, we did a press conference and we wanted to talk to the president and elected officials in regard to what we found. To this day, they have denied to talk to us. Um, so there is still 14,875 lead service lines in Cicero. And we did Berwyn as well. It's not as, as big as Cicero, but they also have lead service lines. So we did go to EPA, Illinois EPA and US EPA. And um, explain what we found. So they did give them some violations in regards to the drinking water um, in Cicero and Berwyn. Um, Berwyn knew this before we did, which I didn't know. Unfortunately, instead of Berwyn addressing the issue with lead in their drinking water after Illinois EPA knew this, um, they created an ordinance. So people, residents that live there had to pay for their own lead service lines. And when we addressed that with EPA, they didn't even know that that happened. It, and that's very discouraging because you would think Illinois EPA have all these lot, all these policies and laws to protect us. Well, unfortunately, they didn't even know what Berwyn had done. And right now, the, um, even though Cicero has not um, had a conversation with us or with Virginia Tech after the Citizens Science Project that we did, um, has applied for some monies just to basically do an inventory of how many lead service lines Cicero has. Basically, they know it's basically for funding what they actually apply for, um, but has not included any of us here in Cicero who did this um, Cicero, uh, science, citizen science testing in our drinking water, has not called us, has not met with us, has not called um, Virginia Tech for anything. So very discouraging, basically reminds me of the previous president, all, all, you know, ignore the best way they do things is ignore, ignore, ignore. But it's so important in my opinion and what I have seen is for universities to do more citizen science projects. Um, I can relate this back to COVID because Cicero has a lot of essential workers and they, we are a hotspot for we're Can we read the slide on COVID? I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, I have a slide on COVID. Can we oh, move okay. ahead? Yeah. Yes. Okay, awesome. So yeah, one in three families, I think you had said, had uh, concerning levels of lead in the water. And when we speak of water, we think of Stickney treatment plant as well, which was the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world. And now it's simply the largest in the US. Japan built one that's bigger. But all of Chicago is sending their poo to Cicero. And it is treated in these open aeration ponds and it does not smell good, right, Delia? Definitely not. We smell poop usually in the summer, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's not disinfected as it's discharged to the sanitary canal. And there are lots of concerns we'll discuss with flooding and sewage. So some other concerns we've got are Amazon's warehouse creating a lot of emissions from the delivery vehicles, the BNSF railway and intermodal where diesel trains and diesel trucks are creating quite a bit of pollution. EPA did a study on those emissions. And again, in the lower right, you see the Stickney wastewater treatment plant. 
So I don't need to tell this audience that particulate pollution is a problem, that particulate matter affects every system in the body. But as Delia was starting to say, COVID, so just a slight increase in air pollution is associated with a 15% increase in the death rate from COVID, even after adjusting for smoking, poverty, number of available hospital beds. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were very concerned. Um, of course, there are lots of folks in Cicero who are essential workers and who are living in um, intergenerational households where there's high health. Uh, density of, of people and sharing quarters. I'll skip this for this audience. And we also, I'm sure, are all aware that those who are causing the pollution are less likely to be exposed. And those who are doing the least to create the problem are breathing the most pollution. So this brings us to Microsoft Project Eclipse putting over a hundred low cost sensors around Chicago, but at first they weren't including Cicero because Cicero is considered um, unincorporated and it's surrounded by Chicago, but it's not considered part of it. So they did this um, project and within a year, they had taken the sensors down. They said that they had decided to change their trajectory or something that was not very informative um, but we got enough data to know that, of course, the West and Southwest parts of, of Chicago have a disproportionate burden of pollution. And so my students partnered with residents of Cicero and Berwyn. Delia led this effort to take handheld particulate matter monitors um, for, loaned to us by the Environmental Law and Policy Center in Chicago on routes. So we had this whole vision of participatory mapping, figuring out what the pollution sources of concern were, what times of day we would want data about. Is it worse at rush hour, for example? And then the pandemic hit, but my um, teams went out anyway. And two weeks, we sampled particular routes walking around with the monitors. And we were surprised that what we found was that the levels of particulate matter were not that much higher than the rest of, of Southwest, the rest of Chicago. And if you look on the bottom right corner, you'll see a wind rose that my colleague Ping created for us. She's an atmospheric scientist. And that shows the direction and the intensity of the wind. So we could try to pinpoint point sources for pollution. And we're noticing that a lot of it is non-point source vehicular emissions. It's not really the source of the of the odors or the health concerns. So the Climate Reality Project donated purple air monitors, and we also had a small amount of funding at Loyola to get a clarity monitor. And we set up our own network of stationary air monitors so that we could see trends over seasons, we wanted to know if summer, for example, is much more polluted than winter. Um, there are more atmospheric inversions, that was the, the thinking. So we were tracking particulate matter over time and we didn't see significant divergences from, from what was going on in the rest of the city. So then with COVID started looking at nitrogen dioxide levels because there was a theory emerging that those who were associated with more severe COVID and increased COVID fatalities. So Tiffany Werner, who is who was with Environmental Law and Policy Center running air pollution uh, programs, and also who worked with uh, Microsoft on Project Eclipse, that network of 100 low cost centers, sensors around Chicago, she, moved to Clarity and she worked with us on getting permission from EPA to co-locate our Clarity node, which took a long time and um, she stuck with it. So we recalibrated our data to match EPAs and we did not see anything particularly worrisome with nitrogen dioxide data. 
what we think is really going on is air toxics. And one of the point sources that is most worrisome is coppers. And coppers is a coal tar facility that is emitting um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and benzene um, and other toxics. Dele, would you like to explain if people were here on the ground, they would see what Morton and a racetrack, what is right around this coppers facility? Yeah, so um, right around the coppers, and I probably, if I knew how to create this map, would say that Pershing Road is the um, toxic um, zones there, which is um, right next door, well, right actually within feet of the racetrack where actually families live that work at the racetrack, including children, is deplorable. So they're actually within feet of coppers. And then there's a waste management, an open field garbage um, place right next door also to the housing where our mostly undocumented folks live as well. And there's, there's some residents and then there's one of the largest um, junior college, which is Morton College there. So and some churches and a couple of small parks there right by coppers. And they are currently, I understand, in violation of emissions. I don't know um, how to translate. How much are they in um, violation in regards to emissions? Um, I have reported this to Illinois EPA. I'm still waiting for a response, um, basically, so they can explain why haven't you um, informed us or our community that this toxic, these um, cancerous emissions that our family should be aware of what is happening, but I'm still waiting, as I said, in regards to um, EPA informing our community, which I learned that unfortunately EPA is basically a handshake with, um, with industries. And Copper's been um, operating without a permit for years, right? They have had lots of exceedances of the original permit um, and yeah, I think you FOIA'd a yes, lot of it, those. Right, I think it's over 15 years that coppers applied for their um, construction operating permit. And um, as of to my knowledge, they have not yet. Um, and that those are one of some of the questions I was asking EPA. You know, you haven't given, you ha they applied, coppers complied. It's just you, you as Illinois EPA have not had um, that permit on so we can um, challenge that permit and hold a hearing. So um, yes, I'm, I'm trying to think what else happened. I know there was a fire a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, again, nobody notifies us. So I had to call EPA to, and the fire department what actually happened. They had a fire. Um, there is a news article, which I, I need to really look for more information, but um, very little um, happened in regards to giving us that information of what we were exposed to with, in regards to coppers when they had that fire. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So community not getting access to the information that they need to stay safe is one major concern because the information that we're getting is from the ATSDR um, database and it's, it's not intuitive. It's difficult to access and interpret. So this is an example of, of one of the charts showing the emissions over time. Um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are one of our big concerns and it's difficult to measure those. We know that there are a lot of health risks associated with exposure, even to low doses. So our plan was to create um, a pilot study using these myexposome silicone wristbands that are passive exposure monitors. They will collect over the course of a month, you leave it on your wrist, they will collect um, whatever you are exposed to from the air, whatever your skin touches, um, you can wear it while you bathe and we can detect not only the level of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, but also which species. 
So we would be able to tell which ones were coming, for example, from smoking in the home versus from coppers. And we thought that this would be a good way of flagging that there's air toxics concerns, which of course the, the data from the ATSDR um, database, which the ProPublica article, you saw that map demonstrate, but the argument is that there aren't residents living right there so that it's not blowing over the residential communities. But as Belia was pointing out, the folks, often undocumented folks working at that racetrack are right next to, feet away from coppers. People are being exposed and Morton College as well. So we were thinking of trying to recruit the staff and faculty and students at Morton to wear the wristbands for a month, but they're a thousand dollars each. And so we were in conversation with Cicero Independiente and Muckrock to, uh, have them fund this. So Muckrock and Cicero Independiente just did their own particulate matter um, assessment. We've had lots of conversations with them. We tried to dissuade them from it and said, we've already collected this data actually, and that's not going to reveal very much. What we really need is air toxics, but, but they went ahead and they just published yesterday, the day before some of their results. Um, so Alfred Diggs and I, the professor in biology, had an idea that we could use lettuce and isopods as um, sensitive organisms. We could grow lettuce in raised beds around Cicero and also in, um, in cleaner areas as a control. And they accumulate PAHs and so do the little isopods. And we could measure the PAH levels in the isopods and the lettuce closer to coppers versus farther away, downwind versus upwind, et cetera, over time. Delia, I didn't tell you, Alfred emailed me this morning and said someone turned off the freezer. They unplugged it to save energy and all the samples were lost. So this is one of our adventures that oh, we no. are uh, going to have to redo our lettuce and isopods before we get our data. But um, another of the issues that we've been concerned about is this school is built on a Superfund site, not just a brownfield, but a Superfund site. And um, they have a plume beneath the school in the groundwater that includes these chemicals, um, some of which are quite volatile, like vinyl chloride. And so, Deli and I co-facilitated a team for Loyola's Health Justice Lab. So these are JD or legal uh, studies students, aspiring attorneys, and MPH students who work together across uh, disciplinary boundaries to study a real problem in the community and to think about how it impacts the health of residents and what legal remedies might be available for them. So. Uh, our team, Stasi, Jennifer, Anu, and Maddie, looked at the possibility of vapor intrusion, where these volatile chemicals would mobilize from the groundwater and from the soil into the air in that school where people have been reporting symptoms that are consistent with acute exposure to these toxics, such as headache and, um, and so forth. And so... Of course, we were only able to do historical document analysis to show what the sources of these compounds might be, what levels have been measured by EPA, what levels have been measured by independent testing firms. Um, we don't have permission to go into the school to do any testing ourselves. So again, we were thinking of using plants that are hyperaccumulators and measuring the level of plants that were kept in a classroom versus in a cleaner environment and trying to do some proxy data that way to see if it's worth investigating further. But um, the pandemic hit and then finally the flooding. So we talk about the community's concerns shifting over time and we only have a couple of moments left, Delia, but if you wanna share what happened July 3rd, 
Yes, basically, um, I have never, you know, even though we've had flooding here quite often, um, that was basically a flash flooding, which that was like basically the worst flooding we've ever had. And living in uh, an older community that has combined sewer lines, basically where the sewage and stormwater is all together and which goes all the way um, to the closest, to the um, Stickney wastewater facility that Sasha mentioned a bit ago. Um, what they did was a lot with, the, first of all, we had our public institutions, I always say, were the same folks who unfortunately, who we depend on or thought they would be giving us information of what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. But it, since it was on a January, I mean, a July 2nd, when it happened, when it was the 4th of July, I'm assuming every, you know, everybody was off. And so they were off whatever um, days off they, they would do. But there was basically, we didn't know as a community, honestly, there was no emergency plan. We were, I'm unaware still, and I've been here 30 years. Um, second of all, you know, while I was trying to get into, that's when I realized something's really wrong. Cause as I was going to my parish, I already, we already had, there was flooding all around by the church and flooding was coming in through the floor. And it was really difficult to find ourselves, you know, driving not away from the water. So there was no emergency plan. Um, we got no information as far as the public health institutions, um, not our local government, not our state government, absolutely no public institution came to inform us what we, sh we should be doing. So basically we were on, um, you know, we were just trying to um, save ourselves and each other as family members um, and as neighbors, you know, most of my neighbors were outside is it's such, you know, we get urban, urban flooding. So people without knowing and I contact, I had to contact all these institutions like the Cook County Department of Public Health, who is our public health institution. Um, and basically I just said, do you have information for flooding? What should we be doing? Cause we don't know what that flood water had in it. But mm -hmm. um, so not the EPA, not even never contacted us either or the local government saying, Hey, you all had um, you know these um, issues with the combined um, sewer lines, and um, you you probably you were exposed to A, B, and C. But unfortunately, to our knowledge as of today, um, pub the Cook County Department of Public Health said they were going to print out some like door, um, but I'm not sure what you call like information in regards to. Flooding. Yeah, door hangers. Um, they did that like two months later and only on my request. I asked if they can do a study because I know studies say that when you have combined sewer lines and overflows, it's, we need really need to be careful what was in the floodwaters. Mm -hmm. Contacted the EPA. I'm still waiting. We did meet with EPA and showed her all the, unfortunately, results that people were in raw sewage mm -hmm. um, because what the Metropolitan Water Reclamation, which is the name of the wastewater facilities here in the Chicagoland area, they reversed, I don't know how, but they reversed the water because they said it would have been worse as far as with flooding. But how do you select a already environmental justice black and brown communities to flood? How do you make a decision where to flood? Um, but so it was mostly in Cook County, the flooding that took place, and they were in black and brown um, zip codes where the flooding happened. To this date, their EPA has not come out to assess our community. Um, I have called some folks that have, I think it's called Centerville, Illinois, who also experienced similar situation as far as, but they were basically worse. It's a rural community that there's sewage on their lawn. So in, in Cicero, we do have, um, you know, an institution, a wastewater facility that um, there was, they should have, somebody should have told us, don't go into those floodwaters. We don't know what's in them because also Cicero, we still use industrial waste. So, and recently the Illinois EPA 
was supposed to, not recently, actually 20 years ago, they were supposed to actually um, review and try to find out um, to actually review the, the waters in our communities. Mm -hmm. And it's been 20 years. It's called the triennial review. Since that's, they're supposed to do it every three years, which it's been 20 years. So recent, so we were, as a community, asked, well, you know what? You need to include the Chicago Sanitary and Chicago Shipyard Canal in regards to your triennial review because we are, we've had all the negative things happening with air with the wastewater and now the flooding. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to put them into this triennial review. Thanks. So basically, yes, we're still trying to get some answers in regard to the flooding. My biggest concern is the health aspects of this because there are a lot, we already know that there's a lot of pathogens in the water here at the shipyard canal. And um, although a couple of folks, some attorneys said, well, don't, fo don't focus on the health impacts. You need to focus on other things as a degradation and things like that. I'm, I'm concerned about it all, but my first priority is, uh, is the people. Definitely. Thank you, Delia. Okay, so I'm just gonna rush through the last slide here. Um, a lot of the soil is clay. And so from an environmental health sciences perspective, we know that clay is not as permeable, which means that, I believe I have a slide here, green infrastructure solutions are less eff effective because you're going to have less water infiltrating and more runoff. But also that means that the residence time of toxics in those top soil horizons um, is increased. So the solution that Cicero presented was to have residents put in a check valve and overhead sewer systems, and they were going to do cost sharing for that. Uh, lots of folks in Cicero don't have papers and will not be eligible for FEMA assistance or for um, a lot of these cost share schemes. And so we'll be left out. And so one of the things that we are really interested in doing moving forward is, um, again, increasing climate resilience and decreasing the, the likelihood of catastrophic flooding and of pathogen exposure, toxin exposure from those floodwaters. I thought we should leave the last few minutes for questions from our very patient audience. Thank you all for, for listening to us today. And we'll just open it up to any thoughts or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha and, and Delia for, for sharing your experience, which of course, you know, um, brings tears to our eyes um, in public health to know these things are are happening in our communities and they're not being um, paid attention to. Um, and so the more that we can work with communities, as you've said, Sasha, and help elevate communities' concerns um, is, is really something that, you know, um, is what we strive for. Um, and it's clearly something that it's unfortunate that we're not closer because, you know, this would make a wonderful student project to be able to come in and, and you know, um, do some of the phone calling, Delia, helping you, you know, navigate this very complex system, which unfortunately in times of crises doesn't necessarily um, deliver um, answers and um in a way that the community knows how to behave um, in terms of changing their behaviors given this particular type of exposure. And based on climate change, these things are gonna get worse. So we're unfortunately in a disadvantage here. That's so true. Megan, you have firsthand experience with Cicero. Sorry, I'm a little sick, so I don't have a lot of a voice, but I, I worked in Cicero for um, about a semester as a clinical fellow, speech language pathologist. And so a lot of your comments about the school system um, definitely resonated with me and the themes of how important it is to, to know and support the people in the community and the way the institutions didn't always have the resources to, to provide what they needed. It was, it was a frustrating place to work, I will admit, um, for those reasons, but I love the people. I hope you feel better. 
All right. Well, Tom. Uh, thank you, uh, Sasha and Adelia, for this very interesting, very informative talk. And I was just, you know, curious of some of those kind of, you know, work you have done and largely kind of want to hear some of your experience. And when you first approached the community, um, how did you build the kind of, you know, the trust from local people and they, their trust to kind of in working with you, their trust, you know, there's a lot. One of those kind of, you know, building the trust is one of those things that they, We've been, you know, we are all facing when we're doing the public house. So I was just curious what was kind of your experience and strategy use. And that's one of the questions. And a second question related to you mentioned that they are those are the largely Hispanic speaking community, a lot of kind of immigrants and the education level. You see that college education is about like between seven to nine percent. Um so I wonder how did you communicate a certain concept, for example, some of those climate change, you know, you want to communicate in a way that they, um, they know it and they accept it. And I was just wondering what was kind of strategy or kind of, you know, uh, you use in, when you're doing your field work. Well, I'll respond to the second question first in terms of communication. Delia is super patient with me when my Spanish sucks and uh, we go back and forth, right, Delia? And is this? Yeah, I, I, honestly, I honestly think there's a big difference when um, someone comes to you and wants to tell you a community what to do instead of asking the community, what is it that you want? What is it that you need? Unfortunately, those are a lot of mistakes that some of the universities have done here um, in regards to specifically, I was just at a webinar two days ago and um, they were talking about the Chicago Center and Shipyard Canal. And, but except that the same wastewater facility that has done harms to us are the same, you know, the metropolitan water companies are the same ones who gave them funding and excluded the people who live here. So, that was a big difference when I met Sasha is, and a lot of universities make that mistake is basically they want to do the studies on what they think what is best. Nobody knows what's best for our community except for those who live here and experience that. And so that was something instilled that Sasha is that I'm inspired and grateful and appreciative of that, that it's more like co-creating together and not just making the assumption that she tells us to what we should, what we, you know, she, the institutions think that they know what we want without even asking us or participating. So it's so important to do a lot of these citizen science projects and not get all this funding at the university level without even having some conversations with some of you know, uh, the community members and include them in. There's been too many studies here also in Cicero, like with COVID as well, um, they talk about how horrible, you know, we got COVID. Well, yeah, we're the essential workers that live here. And they're the ones that kept the country going. But you did not include us. You know, they did these studies like in, in Cook County um, Jail, which is really, to me, condescending because they people died in jail. You could have actually informed our communities that, hey, there's a spike with that COVID wastewater facility um, study that they did and informed us. Um, there's going to be, here comes, a, you know, because they, there's ways they can find out now with COVID through the poop and the wastewater. But they have failed to inform us, look out for this hotspot. These are the things you should be doing. Instead, a lot of our folks died in at Cook County um, as well in jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also just want to say um, our philosophy philosophy in the EJ Collective was that we didn't go to communities. Communities came to us. And so I met Delia and I met Mary Zach and the folks working on the Matt Asphalt Project too, because they put a call out. They contacted the university and said, is there anyone with expertise in this field? We have some questions. And it got passed on to me because people knew that this is a passion of mine. And so then we started forming friendship. And I want to thank Delia during my time in Chicago. Um, I'm terrified of tornadoes. I don't know what I was doing in the Midwest. And I lived in her basement for a week. <laughs> uh, 
because I didn't have a safe place when the big storms were coming through. And she, she put up with my kitties there too. Um, yeah, it was at your mom's funeral. Like we have a heart connection. And so, and you're one of my, my dear friends now in Chicago. So it's not just like, let's accomplish this task, but it's how do we create bridges between the Northern part of Chicago where I was living and Cicero between Loyola and, um, and Excel and Cicero community farms. And so that's been, um, you know, I, I've been through a lot of institutional education, but m some of the greatest lessons that I've learned have been outside of the university myself. I worked for 10 years for Pete Myers. That was incredible doing um, endocrine disruption work and also learning from Delia in these projects um, about how to do FOIAs, about how to contact EPA, what the different jurisdiction is and how to work within these systems to advocate for change. And so I really don't feel like it was um, this direction. I feel like it was really reciprocal. And if anything, Delia helping me and mentoring the students as well. So I know we're right at time. Thank you so much for taking your time, Delia, to come today.